So today I wanted to chat. Usually I do uh, like I speak in conferences about what to do, the different projects and stuff. So but today I wanted to talk to you about one one important thing that is the thing that that us deliver the great products that we are developing. So I think that uh, really uh, Bitfinex and Equinix and Usfinex are um, as a company are like. Um, how can I describe it? But uh, I feel sometimes like a, a child in a candy store because you can play with a lot of technologies. You have, you can pick anyone, anything you want, and uh, we support um, innovation. We support testing. We support um, developers having fun with uh, experimenting. So that's the re really great things of us. So um, as is uh, written here we promote uh, our developers to come up with ideas, to pick projects they like. They, we, we try to not be biased, so, uh, might be, so what I don't like, and I think that hard um, uh, companies to deliver great products is uh, religion wars, internal and external, so we don't want our uh, developers to be part of that. So that's why we are uh, well, really big fans of Bitcoin, Ethereum, EOS, whatever. We, we just, uh, if something can create a value, interest for our, um, for our users, we, we start to pursue it and create the best platform we can around. So, um, we, we try to promote the innovation. Uh, we are uh, really willing to give back to, our, um, to the industry that we work in. Um, some, um, uh, lot of things that we are building. So we are really big believers uh, in open source and we started in 2017 and the, this process, process is, uh, is growing a lot. So uh, we, we believe that um, open source is a good part of our uh, entire infrastructure will, um, will first of all allow us to give back to the, uh, to the, to the crypto community and uh, secondly we will, have, we will have the chance to uh, expand our business and to be uh, to let smaller business to link to us or create something um, completely independent, but that might uh, also um, give us the opportunity to learn from uh, from the others, giving them an already advanced and good developed tools. Um, so we have a, an amazing uh, team. I'm I'm speaking for uh, the development team, but that is true for all the rest of the company. So uh, our motto that it has been made up well. As is a Latin, so uh, I was made by, by Latins, but uh, I'm Italian as my CFO that came up with uh, our motto that means uh, just one but alive. So we got hacked in 2016 and uh, the, no one in the team left. So everyone stayed together. We say, okay, we will fix this thing, we will make everyone whole, and we, um, we will be again uh, the biggest change that we were uh, before or even better. So uh, we are a really small team, so um, our competition varies from the small ones where are like uh, uh, 350 employees till uh, 1.2 thousand employees. Uh, I think that the overall headcount of the company is 90 people uh, for Bitfinex, Adfinex, ESFinex. Um, so really, really small. And the, um, the, the development team varies from, I would say, 18 core developers plus two or three that are uh, basically we we well, we got some help from a couple of external companies or freelancers. So, but everything uh, that you see in our uh, um, platform infrastructure DevOps is just uh, 18, 20 developers. Um, we we like that um, every single developer um, is. Uh, um, come up with ideas, is going to come up with ideas, is uh, um, working with the other developers to, to, to implement them, to, to maintain them, to, and um, we, we like that uh, um, everyone basically start to look uh, at each other code to make sure that it's stable, is scalable, is perfect basically. Um, our team is fully distributed, so uh, one thing that uh, I, um, as, as the CTO, I don't like to spend too much is uh, 
uh, having, I, I want to code all my time, so I don't want to spend time in managing people. So um, I don't need to have them in the office. I want to, them to be anywhere they want, to have to, to where the, in the place they feel, they feel they want to live, um, they can live a better life. Uh, so our entire team is like covering 20, uh, 20 hours. Uh, we have people in uh, almost every continent, um, from uh, and, uh, Europe we have like, we are covering uh, Germany, um, Ukraine, Russia, uh, Italy, um, uh, then we have people in Russia, <coughs> America, South America, and so on. So um, they, we, we just keep, need people that are um, good talkers and play uh, uh, team players. We want people that, um, that they just have fun and smile while they're working. Um, and we want people that are able to uh, deliver really quality code. Uh, we we um, Basically, comments in the code are discouraged because just we want people that are writing amazing code and everyone can easily understand what they're doing, and so everything is scalable and maintainable in the company. And clearly, they have passion. So, um, a good thing uh, in, in uh, our company is that we um, we we kind of be in um, uh, research and development driven. So, first. Uh, we, we find something that we like, we, we think how we can build things on top of it, and then we try to understand how we can make money. But first, we, we want to create, um, make sure that the product we, that we can develop is uh, something that uh, we, we are really keen in uh, bringing it on and, uh, make, and, um, and, um, and build it. Otherwise, the end result cannot be um, really good. So we, um, we design and build uh, most of uh, a slight few frameworks. Everything that we build is uh, custom made and uh, eventually open source. Uh, we believe that we, um, every time we start a new project, we usually try to find if there is some, some code that we can use, uh, uh, libraries that we can depend on, but aside few standard libraries, everything is built uh, now, so for example, we build our uh, microservices system internally, that is pretty cool. Few lines of code that um, allow us to, to scale our infrastructure. Now, um, everyone talks about microservices when you build um, infrastructures like a um, um, big website or uh, um, platforms. Whatever. So, Grenache is a good example because it um, um, takes the idea of uh, the BitTorrent network, so um, where um, People share files, but we, we, we repurpose that for microservices. So instead, um, one, one problem when you create um, really uh, big uh, infrastructure is that, is that you uh, you end up in having dozens of services that need to talk to each other and they need to find each other. So you have like an internal network configuration that you need to spread out and so on. So um, we say, well, BitTorrent that does that really well. So how we can how we can leverage that, that idea. And um, now, um, we, we, it's like, uh, Renash is like, um, you, you have the, the, Lord of, the Lord of the Rings, the film, and uh, someone is willing to find, to download it from you, it's illegal, so don't do that at home. But um, um, then you start announcing that you have the Lord of the Rings to share on, on the network. And who, who wants that can basically, um, uh, use the lookup function of the BitTorrent network to find the, uh, the IPs that have the, that, uh, that particular file. So that is a really simplified version of BitTorrent. So that's exactly the concept of uh, Grenache. So um, I'm, uh, I'm offering this a coffee service. Uh, someone of you want a coffee. And uh, he offered uh, the same service as me. So basically both we start announcing that we offer the coffee service and then uh, we um, and then uh, someone you can clear the network and get the list of people of IP addresses that offer in the coffee service and then um, if you are working in a let's say in a uh, let's say cross region um, uh, network you have your own network cross region with different data centers would work is uh, then it work perfectly because you this give you uh, uh, resilience and redundancy. Um, 
Okay, um, back to the way we design things. So given the fact that we are a really few developers, we, we, we build things to, to scale. And um, so when, when every single component that we build, we think, okay, now, let's say that we have 10, 10, 10 users. How we can, uh, will it resist with uh, 10,000 users? So that's the first thing that we always try to, the first requirement that we try to fulfill. And then needs to, to last a lot of time because we don't want always to go back and say, okay, now okay, this thing is uh, I did it is um, it's made with uh, is kept together with rubber bands, but now I after some uh, some time I need to re revisit uh, the, uh, everything. So if you don't design things carefully, you end up in spending most of your time in trying to fix things and um, shuffle things around to 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 survive. That's exactly what we don't want to do because we don't want to grow too much the, the team. Um, in this way, the maintenance is reduced and you can focus on the things that really matter. So, um, we have, well, we, we, we have, uh, let's say, different um, products. Bitfinex is the, the first one um, that is uh, uh, our, let's say, main platform. We serve um, Almost the major uh, cryptocurrencies is um, is a really cool project. We 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 spend a lot of time in, in designing the UI, the backend. We 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 are really excited by the, the power and scalability. And we have, I would say, um, five six big projects that are coming the next months that will um, improving uh, that will improve the experience. Will make it uh, let's say uh, more open. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you will. You'll see um, a lot of talk about these things because they, mm, it, it's all about open sourcing our <coughs> stack and make it more uh, and make all the different parts of the platform more available for users to develop on. So I'm happy to to, to, to expand on that if uh, someone wants. Then we have Atfinex started like uh, well, the idea came up uh, last year and uh, we we released the first version at the beginning of this year. And then uh, from there, we, 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 we feel like we started to be the, the ideal home for, uh, for the Ethereum-based tokens. Um, Atfinex Trustless uh, has been launched two weeks ago. And it's been a really amazing project. It took some time to make it uh, working properly because we, we, we are willing to understand if there was any attack vector for us to let's say, lose money because we are kind of um, basically, um, that is, an amazing way of scaling uh, without keep giving up custody. So um, Atfinex um, allow you to assess our um, central liquidity, um, super fast execution, while um, still you keep uh, the funds under your control. Uh, and then the last one is Finex, is a super nice project. Uh, we started developing it like uh, two months ago. It's a full chain, um, so it's the it's different from uh, from the other. Um, the other projects because being fully on chain mean uh, all the uh, order books, trades, segments, uh, the cost of withdrawals, everything happening on chain. Uh, it will start as a side chain of EOS, uh, then we will decide if we want to bring, in, uh, uh, bring it to main chain. Probably yes, but uh, um, with, uh, with EOS at the moment, we, we, uh, we are waiting for. Um, um, EOS IO development uh, team to, to implement the BFT uh, deposits that allow us to have a um, last irreversible block um, to get the last irreversible block faster. Um, so this brings to the discussion that uh, Bitcoin started as a centralized exchange um, and we, there is a big movement to basically start leveraging um, um, the different uh, different blockchain to build uh, decentralized exchange. So, as as you see uh, just just before, uh, there are good selling points from both sides between uh, centralized and decentralized exchanges. And I try to summarize um, what most of the, the, the ones that think that are relevant. So, uh, usability um, <coughs> is something that over time will will uh, I think that. Uh, both centralized and decentralized exchanges will match. Uh, but clearly, um, centralized exchanges are uh, hiding the complexity 
uh, or part of the knowledge that the, the, the initial knowledge that the user needs to have to be on board and start trading. So my father could uh, easily start trading in uh, on uh, on uh, a centralized exchange while understanding first how to create a wallet and so on is a um, is a, a more difficult um, um, part for him. So. Um, then, um, at the same time, uh, centralized exchanges have, have higher uh, liquidity usually. Um, and um, that is really important because really the where you make money is, uh, and for exchange, is, uh, is liquidity. Is how, um, is, uh, how uh, the volume and the liquidity. So the liquidity is, uh, let's say, how many, um, for example, BTCUSD, how many Bitcoin you need to um, spend to move the price for a certain, you know, for a certain amount, and the volume is how many in let's say in USD value, how uh, um, total amount of uh, trades you you executed during a certain period of time, and uh, usually centralized exchanges are winning that <coughs> side because um, they start earlier, they the adoption is easier, and usually when you think to the centralized exchange, you have to. Uh, as, you, as I showed you before, you, 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 you create something that is bonded to a certain technology like uh, Yusfinex or Adfinex. So, and then you have the problem where, um, except for example, Yusfinex will not be used easily by people that are big believers in Ethereum and vice versa. So um, these kind of religion wars are probably affecting, the, 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 in my opinion at least, um, uh, the exchanges that are focusing on a single on a single blockchain, and um, that is a sad thing for the market, but I think it's true. So um, also uh, trading future uh, features, so it's easier to develop for um, uh, in on centralized exchanges. Also for um, a thing that I reported here below, because when when it comes to developing on a centralized exchange is uh, you have traditional uh, challenges. So things, uh, exchanges are, um, uh, traditional exchanges have been around for 30 years. There is a lot of knowledge. You can use uh, pre-built libraries. You can build, you can use a lot of tools that are available and there is a lot of knowledge. Well, when it comes to, um, to um, the centralized exchanges, most of the time you have to think again how to, you need to uh, bring your knowledge and apply it to Something that is completely different, or you have to, you have to um, learn a new language uh, and try to understand how not to get hacked and so. Um, well, security um, th that is the, uh, the, the the bad part of centralized exchanges is that you have to trust a single entity, and it's not that that entity, at least in our case, want to keep all your money. For um, if uh, Bitcoin X could keep put could offer the best trading platform, but not have and uh, not be liable to the customers for keeping their money. That that would be great because we want to focus on the best platform ever in a trading platform ever. Not we don't want, in theory, we, we don't want to offer crypto custody. Uh, when we got hacked in 2016, only like 20 or 30 percent of uh, of the um, the funds that were um, um, stolen were used in active positions. Everything else was um, crypto custody, um, and um, we don't make money on uh, on holding user funds. So that's why uh, I think that uh, um, decentralized exchanges are really a good thing for both sides. The users can keep control of their funds, while um, while uh, at the same time um, exchanges are not um, less subject to uh, attempt and so on. Um, also, another thing is that um, yes, we um, it's easy to onboard a user on a centralized exchange, but at the same time, for the growth of, the, of this industry, it would be really nice if uh, users can start to understand uh, how things really work. So, pushing the user to um, to the awareness of creating their wallets, uh, securing the private keys, using hardware wallets, and so on is really important. So. Uh, that's one of the things that we will try to push for in, in NBC. Then, uh, um, well, I already talked about it, and then transparency. So, uh, one other uh, weak point of centralized exchange is the fact that uh, 
you um, um, you never know if the, the exchange will uh, front run you, for example. So that's that's a, that's a problem because you don't want um, to send an order and know that then someone in the exchange can place an order before you to to, to basically take part of your drop. Uh, so at the same time, uh, on a decentralized exchange, you have the problem that. Um, creating like uh, more complex order types like, like uh, stop order, stop limit, um, be, and at the same time being fully uh, on chain or fully transparent might result in a problem because you don't want uh, people to see stop orders, just you want people to see limit orders. So that increase, in not saying that it's not possible, just that will increase the complexity of, uh, of uh, offering a lot of uh, different um, trading tools. And then performance. So performance is, um, I put a question mark, because um, uh, Bitfinex does um, scale to millions of orders per second. We, 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 will, we are not reaching that level at the moment. But uh, our uh, matching engine does that, so can, can achieve that. On, on chain, instead, um, you can now, I guess, that the best shot is on there, for example, if you want a fully on chain exchange. and. Um, you can do like 5,000 uh, orders per second that uh, still cannot be compared to um, the performance that is now achievable from uh, on a standard exchange. Well, that's it. Uh, so, oh, yeah, no. Um, as you can see on our GitHub page, we have now 86 um, uh, open projects. Every um, every single um, every single project, every single functionality that we we, we build. Um, result in a, in a small project. So the tinier, the better, because it's more maintainable. Most of the projects are related to, to Grenache. So, um, um, as I mentioned, Grenache is a, a microservices uh, framework, and we built microservices to basically directly interact with Twilio, Slack, SendGrid, and uh, a lot of other um, online services. So you can build a network of, uh, of, um, of tools that can all work together to provide um, to your users, a lot of, uh, of, of services. So, thank you. So, two questions. My first one is how do you incentivize people to move into the trustless system? Because you mentioned you don't want to be a custodian of funds, which I think is very important from a hacking standpoint. So, how do you get everyone? or well, at least many of those individuals to come into trust. How do you incentivize them? That's a, that's a really good question. So we are... Um, so it's part of a, a marketing issue because we want to, to push them to have... Um, so the Ethernet trustless portal is perfect for that because most of the time one, one big problem would be that you, okay, you, you start trading on a decentralized exchange then you want to buy like a, 100 uh, in uh, Ethereum, and if you do that, you move too, too much the price. While Atrix Trustless, as it is now, is a good approach because basically you say, okay, um, if you are willing to trade uh, ERC20 tokens or Ethereum, you can just do that and go there, and you still have the same performance, but you have control of the funds. So it's a an amazing proposition. They they can use MetaMask, they can use Ledger, they can use Trezor. So, the um, I think that uh, people need to be um, pushed towards decentralized exchanges step by step. You cannot say, okay, now you are on your own, and uh, I don't care about you, about your money. Just use the that product. So we we need to basically uh, give them a good reason uh, while keeping the, the to use a decentralized exchange or uh, let's say. Uh, and um, give them, keep, uh, make sure that they keep the capacity while giving, uh, giving them the same features of the centralized chain. So that's why we design an uh, ad finance in the way it is now. And uh, perhaps a little more of a technical question. And how can you provide that liquidity and that like, uh, velocity if you are not the custodian? So what happens really uh, behind the scenes is that uh, Bitfinex or Adfinex will take the other leg of the trade. So how do you make sure you're not left like fulfilling the trade when the other person did not deliver the Ethereum or whatever? Because basically the, cost, the, the users will commit the liquidity on a smart contract. So, oh. so basically we allow 
Um, and, and, and the cool thing is that they commit the liquidity to a smart contract, and then every and that uh, that they're like uh, they put uh, ten uh, ten and Ethereum on a, on the on a, on a wrapper smart contract with a, let's say uh, time in force. So after one hour, they get back the funds. They can basically get back the funds from from the smart contract. So uh, in um, so they then can start submitting orders to the to FNX Trustless. And basically, we have the timing force uh, parameter for each of our orders. So we say we set the timing force parameter for each of our orders basically to um, uh, 15 seconds less than the, the, the unlock timeout that is not also on smart contract. So we ensure that if an execution happens, we can set all the order on chain. And um, at Finex, take the other leg to basically so keep enough on a, let's, let's say, is the one that uh, that settled the thing. Thank you. Um, well, let's assume, like we had uh, two weeks ago, a hack of a Japanese exchange. Yeah. Um, now those hacked funds ended up at Binance and Huobi, if I uh, heard correctly. What if those people used to trust us? How would you deal with that? Because then. Aren't you uh, responsible for that if those hacked funds ends up at um, Ethernet or you know Ethernet? Well, I'm not the legal guy here, so I'm not sure if I, we are responsible. Um, at the same time, can I ask that one? Um, yes. Yeah. So I think actually something that's really interesting on Trustus is that um, because you're doing this trade in settled on chain, even if you exchange it for another another set of funds, because you have to do it by a centralized matching engine, you can't. Um, so a tr traditional thing might be you'd sell at a really bad price on a decentralized exchange and get them out that way in a different address. But here you can't do that. Your funds would still be on the same address. So it's, it's still tr the, the, the line is still completely traceable, no, no matter what you do with those on Ethereum, even though you've exchanged them for, you know, from Ethereum to some other ERC-20 token, it's the same address as holding it. So you can still be blocked from all other exchanges from cashing out. Which is quite cool. Regarding EOS Phoenix, is that going to be entirely EOS assets? And to that extent, will it be able to operate entirely on the EOS chain, potentially without even any oversight in terms of adding assets and such, because they would appear on the chain, and then you'd be able to just have them automatically appear. And in terms of that, if it's going to be entirely on chain, how are you going to look into um, maintaining liquidity and such, rather than allowing it to become another one of these decentralized wastelands that's got very little active order books? Okay, so um, to answer, I guess that there are basically two questions there. So um, we we uh, still will create the list of uh, tokens that can will trade on Yosfinex. So it means that. Um, um, really, we will use the same concept of uh, we are using with Atnex with a wrapper. So we only allow tokens that are wrapped by our exchange contract. Um, the cool thing is that we will try to uh, issue tethers for uh, like other cryptos. Also. <coughs> so it means that um, you can you can trade um, uh, 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 BTC and that that goes also for 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 um, We we are working on that side too, because we believe we want to create a way for um, for swap uh, to swap um, Ethereum with BTC, and clearly it's uh, easier for 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 .to, uh, not be <coughs> subject to claims and um, uh, being sc uh, scammed because at that point you you can see that uh, on a Bitcoin address there is a certain amount of Bitcoin. On, on, on the ERC20 token or on the EOS token, you have issued a certain amount of, of, of tokens as well. The same amount should match, and that's it. So that should be uh, much easier on, uh, on uh, the Tether side, and at the same time, allow proper um, swaps between, uh, uh, let's say, uh, cross-chain mm, cross um, assets. So that's, that, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that we want, we, um, we are not used to market make on our exchanges, so we never do that, but to, to not show uh, an empty restaurant for, for EOS Finance, for example, 
we will um, we will create a small market maker tool that will basically uh, bring the liquidity that we have on EOS USD to to the um, to the uh, EOS USDT that we will have on EOS US. So would you not differentiate between potentially tethered EOS assets and actual EOS assets so as to project the idea that there is more liquidity because if they were to be technically the same you could just have that order book it's just like you do with USD on Bitfinex it's technically tethered but isn't you could do the same with an EOS order book you could have tethered assets that aren't separate from the actual asset which means you could cross chain the order book perhaps is that some sort is that sort of what you're looking at potentially there? Um, yes so we um that is, I'm, I'm not sure I uh, properly answer this. So my, my feeling is that you you uh, have users that are going to use EOS Finex just because they don't trust Bitfinex or they because everything in EOS Finex will be open source, smart UI, smart contract, whatever. So they can say uh, they can bring the smart contracts to their uh, C++ developer and get it audited if they don't trust the audits that we are going to do. So is not that um, so I think that they have different purposes they, they will uh, serve different cast, uh, type of users so I'm I'm not uh, saying that so we will offer the same product the same books just on different places because we believe that um, decentralized exchanges offer a, a really different um, serve a different type of user and I think almost that's kind of it because uh, for example, we uh, Bitfinex is going to start migrating the all its operation in this month to um, a, um, a segregated data center where we own the hardware, we own all the infrastructure. Because we found out that some, uh, at this point, AWS we are uh, still on AWS hardware is kind of a bottleneck for us. So um, you know when. It's never like to have your own SSD that you picked for your bright performance and so on. So, and when it comes to an exchange, then we can bring the latency that on average like 20 milliseconds to for the entire round trip to send an order and receive a feedback to two milliseconds, one millisecond, and then some millisecond in the next like one year or one year and a half. So, then uh, you you can see that have, having the same kind of um, uh, let's say performance on a on an on chain exchange is kind of hard because most you know what, one thing important fact is that um, usually people think okay uh, EOS can do uh, five thousand transactions per second but really you have two blocks in in that second right so it means that two and a half uh, thousand transactions go in one block and two point five go in the other block but usually what market makers do is they send one order. And they want they send the second order based on the feedback they receive from the first order. So it's not like they want to flush in the, down the toilet one thousand orders in a second. That's it. They are happy. It's not like that. They want to to do as many as operation all all linked together in the same second. So, but everyone based on the feedback on the previous one. So that's why uh, matching the performance of a centralized exchange is really difficult. Uh, they. We will maybe eventually get there, but uh, there are two different abuses, I think, and two different propositions. If that answers your question, uh, could it not? Just, sorry, I you quick on. Could it not cause an issue with the fact that you're merging order books with the fact that the decentralized, like, like decentralized trustless, could it not cause an issue that that would have lower latency than the decentralized book? Well, yes, but then um, um, again, what we are going to do it is we, we will uh, start market making with a uh, higher spread to prevent to basically less be uh, not subject to let's say uh, big uh, market movements. Just at the be just only at the beginning and just to not show an empty restaurant. So we will uh, take some risk, but we will create a bigger spread uh, between bid and ask just to basically give the opportunity to people, to, for to users, to try the product without basically having just uh, five orders per side. So the, the more the people will start using it, we will uh, slow down market making and eventually we will stop it. I don't like it, but uh, at the same time you need to offer a product that is usable and uh, will have some liquidity. Yeah, you got a decentralized wasteland here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Mm -hmm.
Um, so imagine like it's finished right now, it's only about UC20 trustless, uh, but how do you see like, uh, well it's more of a general question, but for all the rest, I mean, if you want to do a Bitcoin trustless or Litecoin trustless or all the other currencies, is that something you've already thought about it? So I think that uh, one of our uh, big challenges for the next year is like the network. So how we want to, uh, how we uh, can add it to um, Bitcoin X um, and how, um, so it's clear how we can use it for like uh, market makers to basically keep uh, custody of uh, their funds on, uh, let's say, their side or use the custody on their <coughs> side anyway. But um, it would be really nice, so for, it would be really nice to have like Omni, uh, the Omni Foundation, um, integrating with the, with the um, uh, uh, Lightning Network to allow uh, atomic swaps for uh, Bitcoin and, uh, and Litecoin, for example, uh, Bitcoin and, um, and USDT on Omni. Uh, and you can do that for Litecoin and so on. So we are uh, willing to um, devote a lot of um, um, our time, uh, starting from next year, to implement that, because I think that Lightning Network is an amazing product and will have a huge use case in Bitcoin. Uh, so EOS has showed us that they have the ability to freeze and revert funds uh, to the liking of the ECAF. So for an exchange like um, EOS Phoenix, how do you propose to protect your users from potentially buying funds which may be locked or reverted? So, um, I was waiting for this question. <laughs> so, uh, well, that is a tricky one. So, um, well, there is a lot of, I have been a lot of talk here about the government. So, and um, uh, I'm, uh, most of you have more um, experience than me, more knowledge than, uh, but um, not the matter. But um, at the same time, I think that uh, uh, no one uh, and uh, the same ECAF doesn't want, uh, don't want, they don't want to break uh, EOS down. So they, no one, uh, one thing is freezing the assets, but really is delaying the decision. And I kind of agree with that. I was part of um, uh, being a Bitcoin uh, product <coughs> user. We had to uh, implement the, 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 fr the, the, the freeze request in um, to um, temporarily uh, delay uh, or um, uh, not allow uh, withdrawals from from that address, and I think is um, is a really powerful tool. And when it comes to anyway regulators, you uh, for example, on um, we we prove that thing with uh, with the Omni. We um, um, Tether.to had a security issue with uh, for thirty million dollars. And we were able to freeze instantly the funds to not allow them to move. So, I mean, you can see, I, I guess that you can always see things from both sides. You can say, okay, now um, uh, we, want, uh, we, we want to give the full control to the user and nothing can be reversed. But in some cases, um, it might be interesting to have another option. So, yes, I'm, I'm for freedom. I'm for not uh, for immutability, for sure. But, uh, um, I mean, I'm also open to see the other side of the coin, and uh, I'm happy that, that there are alternatives. In the end, uh, people will choose the one that they prefer. And um, for a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, people that, the users that are not uh, tech savvy, knowing that uh, if they mess up, that there, they, the, um, there is the chance to recover the funds is not a bad thing. So it's really always about trying to understand what the, um, um, the, the good points and bad points and good points of, of all the blocks. Thank you very much. I think that's the last question. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'm sure you can find Paolo later. Okay, thank you.